But you'll notice there's a surprising amount of sediment here too. Most of this is probably uh, old shells and tests and things from the surface ocean. Animals like foraminiferin shells, they, after they die, they fall down to the bottom and accumulate. Uh, but we do have some push cores that we took earlier, so we should be able to get a pretty good idea of what precisely the sediments are made out of here. Yesterday we were seeing quite a bit of sediment up on top of some of these seamounts, but they're not quite very deep, uh, maybe a couple inches. So we weren't able to really effectively sample that with the tools that we had. Bamboo coral. Sea star? Bamboo coral. Oh yeah, right hand side. Sea star. Red. I think this might be a bersingid also. We did see a uh, in our zoom? rock collection last night we did see a baby bersingid. Very, a baby very, bersingid. Very young one. Yeah. No more than about uh, a few centimeters okay, across. Wide. Thank you, video. You said that came up on one of the rock samples. Right. Yeah, we thought it was a brittle star at first, but it was uh, definitely a Oh, bersingid. that was the one we sampled on our watch then. I, I seem to remember a brittle star. We were like, oh, yeah, there's a brittle star on that rock. Yeah, there, there were some actual, actual brittle stars on the rocks. Okay. Uh, it may have been different, I think, from the one we collected, because the one we collected what, did have a brittle star, and we did sample oh, okay. a brittle star from that sample. And you would know it was a brisingid just because it had the spikies on it? Yeah, the very, very stiff spines and um, very much different uh, morphology than the brittle stars. Still seeing a lot of these traces, but not seeing very many more of those limpets. They're persistent, though. It kind of gives you an idea. The sedimentation rate here is so, so slow that when a limpet comes along and disturbs the surface sediment on the rocks, it takes a long time for those traces to disappear. Oh, coral. That thing. Can we take a look at that? Oh, yeah. Coral. Yeah, totally. Go for zoom. We'll start at the base, I think. I'll drift towards the rest of it. Is this something you want polyp zooms on? Uh, as good as as good as you can get. Okay. That's good. Some sort of very sparsely branching Chrysogorgia colony. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Okay, Even has a shrimp wide. associate with it. You can try zoom again. At least a pair of shrimp. Yeah. Great view. Yeah, that's beautiful. It does share some characteristics with uh, Eritogorgia, kind of a semi semi helical axis, but um, probably within the genus Chrysogorgia, given the branching pattern of the branchlets coming off the side. Okay. Great. We Thanks. good?
How's that craft comp holding? I think it was actually when I just peeked at it, it was pretty good. Yeah, low, low three. Motor comp seems good. Well, might as well start gaming now. Now that you got me started. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, I've got a question for you. A couple that have come in from our viewers. Yeah, go and ahead. They're curious, how does Nautilus know its position? Um, people are curious, you know, does GPS work this deep underwater? And how do we know where our ROVs are compared to the ship? Yeah, um, that is a great question. I'm going to hold off on answering yes. it just to move the ship. But totally. It we'll will not be you. forgotten. <laughs> So Science Steve, or Watch Lead, another question coming in. What are our mission objectives for this watch? So we, uh, we generally have shared objectives throughout all the watches. Um, since we're kind of just doing basic exploration out here, uh, we don't um, really have, uh, with some exceptions, like really prescribed Bridge, nah. uh, objectives. We're just out here to ex explore and see what we see. But we do have a couple of requests Can we move 50 um, meters? One, that five, we zero. can accommodate for both scientists who are doing work out here. That's it. Um, in this case, we're sampling rocks uh, at certain intervals along our dive. And whichever watch tends to be on during those uh, sampling um, depths that are targeted. Uh, we'll do uh, targeted sampling of rocks and, and water. Uh, but we also have kind of more broad general objectives for sampling from our scientists ashore community. Um, so you know, these might include specific groups of biological organisms or specific kind of rocks or specific kind of water. So uh, yeah, it's for the biology, it's it's very open ended. We're you know largely trying to find species that may not be well known from these parts. Um, you know, for example, if they've been seen but not identified, uh, we would collect something like that. Or if we think it could be a new species or a new record for the area, those are of um, importance. And then for rock sampling more specifically, we're trying to get a hold uh, of a uh, handle on questions about um, composition of these iron manganese crusts that are on the rocky surfaces. So this is all the black coating you're seeing on the rock. Um, and then as well, you know, if we get the right kind of rock, we can usually sample some of the crystals that formed when this rock, when the seamount was uh, formed millions and millions and millions of years ago that tell us something about how old the seamount is relative to the surrounding seafloor. Kate, what was that depth that we were getting our next sample at? 2932. Okay. We got over 100 meters to go. Okay. Doesn't seem to be flattening out at all, even though the contours are getting spaced. Yeah. I'm wondering how, how much of a plateau this will be. 
The terrain's pretty mellow. It's been pretty consistent, and it's not super hard to come up. Maybe it's it's definitely it's definitely a shallower slope than it was. Cucumbers are enjoying the sediment on the rocky surface too. They seem to be the only ones. Those, them, and the limpets feeding on the organic material that falls from the surface here. We're not seeing a huge amount of suspension filter feeders. Oh, on the right hand side, there is something though. Oh, yeah. Might be oh, our I first uh, yep. oops, wrong tool. So I haven't actually seen any of the limpets yet. I've just seen their trails. Yeah, they were a bit deeper. I'm thinking okay. that. Yeah, maybe we we're just in an area where they're poorly represented, but they were definitely a lot deeper, 200 meters deeper. They were quite common. We have one down in the lab you can look at. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, they're really neat. Go for zoom. This guy's just not tall enough to try that with, I fear. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think this might be one of our first, uh, well, let's see. A primnoid. Yep, it's a primnoid. Full zoom. Okay, thank Octa you. Octocoral. Probably in the genus Norella. And I was wondering if there was an associate on it. If we tilt there down. is. Yeah. Saw an crab, anemone, maybe. I think. Crab or anemone? Yeah. And try that zoom again. Anemone, maybe? I don't know. I can't tell. Yeah. Can't quite make it out either. Go for zoom. Keep going. Snail? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a snail. Kind of looks like that snail we saw laying eggs on that sponge yesterday. Okay, go wide. Oh, yeah. I feel like that snail might be eating it. It could be grazing, yeah. It's absolutely something that they would do. They are predators down here, snails. And nothing down here is making its own food from sunlight here. Everything's eating something else. And all the primary production is, is from the surface? Yeah. There's no chemosynthesis of any kind anywhere not, around here? Not in this area, not that we're aware of. If we did find that, it would be pretty phenomenal. Sometimes it seems like an awful lot of life to be supported by like the dregs of what's going on upstairs. Yep. Totally. It's fascinating. Yeah. You get certain patches, certain depth zones where you get more. But generally, the deeper you go, the less um density of organisms there is not that the, it's not necessarily that there are any fewer of them or that there's you know, they're just any less diverse but you have to travel 
a longer distance and make more observations to see as many species of organisms. But of course, the deeper you go, the bigger your habitat becomes uh, because you eventually reach the, the abyssal plain, which is most of the Earth. That's a crazy thing to think of. But even down there, you know, you can have small micro topography and micro habitats, you know, on abyssal hills or, or bumps in the seafloor. Just a little bit of change in topography can result in a really different community. why in part that these nodule fields are so prolific with new species of life because uh, on the abyssal plain where a lot of these deep water nodules are located a nodule or even a group of nodules creates a pretty substantial effect on the seawater and how it flows over the bottom and a lot of suspension and filter feeding animals take advantage of that change in flow or feeding and uh, dispersal reproduction types of things. Very curious, um, after we do our little Go for zoom. along the wall transect here. Um, oh, there's another yeah. like mucus house there. Uh, not sure, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's more Go wide. flexible. Nobody's home, probably. Sorry, I interrupted you, Steve. After we finish this transect? No, yeah, after we reach that kind of depth that this target's at, we're going to try and travel lateral along the wall for a bit. Um, just kind of see what the variability is like along a depth contour. So we've been traveling up uh, you know, these steeper slopes and verticals for quite a long part of the dive. Just so we don't finish the dive too early, we're planning on spending at least 24 hours here to accomplish our science objectives. If we lateral along the wall, we can Stretch it out a little bit. Yeah, I was going to do one more move and then we can start doing those lateral movements that will put us at the right depth. We have that target in, um, and then, yeah, move to the northeast. I wonder what these cylindrical rock formations could be. Bridge, now. Oh, yeah. It's Very unusual like rock this? shape. Like what's happening here? Do you think this could be sponge skeleton or something? One five zero. I don't know. Take a look at it. Go for zoom. Like what are you? There's some more irregular shaped ones to the left hand side too that kind of look. Yeah. Oh, there's uh, also a little teeny thing sticking out of the sand there. Yeah, yeah a little of them. tube worms. Yeah. Those oh, yeah. are tube worms? Well, yeah. not, not like the chemosynthetic yeah. Kind of tube worm, but yeah, worms in tubes, I guess. <laughs> worms in. <laughs> yeah. So here's a. I feel like these got to be sponge skeletons. Yeah. Uh, some of some of them are sponge skeletons, although um, the ones on the left hand side most certainly. Like, yeah, it's that's like a Brussels, Brussels sprout. sprout one. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to squeeze it's one huge. and see if it breaks? <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Th this one in front of us kind of looks manganese coated, though. So. Wondering. Where, where do you want to head to here? Manganese coated one? Yeah, the, the, the one kind of in front, because the ones on the left hand side most certainly are sponges, but I'm wondering if these uh, darker ones that have pretty obvious iron manganese crusts are uh, also sponge. I would really doubt it. 
but okay. you know it, it's we, we have seen some suspicious looking you know cylindrical or barrel shaped can you give me the shoulder okay i only have a second here Broke right apart. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I bet it's a sponge skeleton. Sponge. Yeah, deceptive, right? Because usually we don't see sponges that are really old enough to kind of acquire these iron manganese oxides, but clearly here they do. So it could be a good area for press precipitation. Okay, onward. It's a very old sponge skeleton. That's pretty wild. I think we should call them sea sticks. <laughs> Dude, there's a bunch of them around here. Uh, it's, it's not unusual to see a lot of animal bases uh, completely encrusted in a dark iron manganese crust. I've seen that very odd, um, heavily crusted coral bases in the Caribbean. Uh, really puzzling because typically in the Pacific you don't really see the coral bases uh, and, and coral colonies manganese crusted because they tend to dissolve over time before they can acquire a crust patina. Um, yeah. Hmm. So the chemistry is just different in the Atlantic and Caribbean such that they can acquire that before they're eroded away, dissolved away over time. Do we know? Oh, hey, coral. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, do we know how long it takes for that manganese iron coating? cover things or like the rate of that yeah variable but um, millimeters per millions of years is pretty good uh, approximation depends on the local oceanography of the area as well hmm. go for zoom yeah you got to be around for a long time <laughs> yeah a long time this oh. one is almost certainly a yeah, it's a primnoid in the genus norella with an n n a r e Double L A. Is that an associate on it, or is it like a little bud or node or? Yeah, th th it's probably some sort of um, irritant animal that probably settled on there. It looks like the coral fought back and was able to grow polyps over it. Go wide. Cool. It looks like Steve. Uh, video Steve even if you're a little bit to the side just as long as you're not sh you're sh not shining your light straight on a bunch of bright stuff yep. it just looks better totally and that's what you were talking about right yeah it doesn't have to be a totally black bat like abyssal backdrop as long as you're not getting that like crazy reflection from the sand or something yeah and the separation the further the background is away it just helps it oh more, I see okay you can get a little more clear image of what you're using done yeah, so you can like you can differentiate it through focus and through lighting and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Totally. Cool. The dream is like a huge coral, right? Where it's like out into the blackness. Right. Um, but yeah, even if the background is like a meter away rather than half a meter, it makes a big difference. Right. 
Yeah, like this guy is totally invisible until you separate him from the background. Yep. More of this Chrysogorgia colony we're seeing. One of the now three species of corals that are fairly common in this area. Actually, we did see a sea pen earlier, very early on in the 8 to 12 watch. We did see an Umbalula sea pen, typical of the deeper abyssal environment, especially with sediment. Go for zoom. What was the name of it? What kind of sea pen? Uh, it was called an Umbalula. Umbalula. Unbelievable. It's a good name. Almost like Evan Palupa. Keep going. This one is a Chrysogorgia colony. Oh. Okay, go wide. Almost like that one wanted to jump in the box. Yeah, it did. <laughs> really did. When we do the turn onto this lateral movement, are we going to stop the ship or are we just going to kind of go into a well, turn? Well, that is great timing. Um, we're coming to a stop right now. So I was going to let Argus and Herc settle out a bit and then start the lateral movement to probably bearing 060, looking at the Hercules sonar, um, the wall right in front of Hercules. So we'll be starting, I don't know, within the next five minutes. Okay. There are tons of these things that we're thinking are uh, encrusted sponge skeletons. Yeah. There's like a lot of them here. This the is sea sticks you're talking about? Yeah. This is not a good place to be a sponge, but it may, it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. The bases can tell a story about what used to be here. Oh. This is a beauty. A glass sponge. Not sure what it is yet. Can you tell more from the osculum or from uh, or the just base? Just the or? overall morphology. So I think this one is going to be colophagus, just based on how it's opening on the back end. Go for zoom. I don't recall seeing this one too frequently earlier in the dive, so it might, we might be moving up into a different layer of animals. Oh, We've cool. That'd be awesome. started to see these uh, Norella colonies also pop in quite deep. Um, so he's holding tight now? Yeah, board. and Argus should be settling out within two minutes or so, and then we're just going to go uh, parallel to the slope rather than up the slope. And right, that sounds great. Yeah, eyeing your sonar and the contours, it looks like we'll want to start with going at, um, I think, six zero zero six zero. Okay. Uh, well... Maybe seven zero seven zero. Uh, yeah, and we'll just do fifty meter moves and adjust as necessary. Sounds great. And I think it was about oh, three hundred and fifty meter lateral move. Okay. Should we take bets on how long we think it's going to take us to break, to get the turn in? No, to get over to our waypoint two. Was that a measured waypoint? Or is that... Uh, oh, sorry. I guess it would be the lateral move then to make the ascend to waypoint two. 
Um, sorry, what do you mean by measured waypoint? No, did, did they measure that out to be a certain length, like is it certain hundreds of meters away? Oh, or is it just a random waypoint right now? I think it's just a random waypoint, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's 250 meters away about where okay. we we'll want to start our ascent up. So I did the lateral move and up then up. let's see over here. Um, so once we get here, we can make a straight ascent up, right? That will be perpendicular to the slope. Does that make sense? Yes. And that is our waypoint three. Looks great. Go for Zoom. This will just be a quick one. Say hi to this guy. OK. Shrimp. Yep. There's also, yeah, some small other primnoids on the oh, yep. large, large boulders. Zoom again. Oh, yeah, coral there. I think that's what we just saw too, just a smaller yeah, I colony. Yeah, so. Seems right. Just relatively recent recruitment here. Okay. Very relatively speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds or thousands of years? Hundreds. Oh, I, I, Tens? I, uh, say certainly decades. Okay. Yeah. Possibly longer. I wish sometimes we had, um, you know, on certain things like shipwrecks, sometimes we have uh, human substrates that, uh, human-made substrates, like shipwrecks that tend to give us absolute dates, um, you know, if we know when the ship went down, for example, um, and it's covered with corals and sponges, we know it, it can be a maximum of X numbers of years old, um, and it probably takes a, a number of years for recruitment to happen, but, um, you know, on things like shipwrecks, you know, those are natural barriers to flow and you know things get accelerated over shipwrecks and lots of stuff attaches to them and that's a good food source so that makes the corals and sponges more productive um, so those types of habitats usually you can use you as ready? kind of artificial dating to tools. move to the side yep. yeah yeah that's fine i'm gonna do zero seven zero okay for 50 meters sounds good bridge nav Fifty meters bearing zero seven zero, please. To the best of my knowledge, there aren't any shipwrecks out here That's with, uh, you know, these kinds of substantial coral covers. Um, you know, we saw in the Gulf of Mexico several years ago some pretty phenomenal uh, coral cover on um, wrecks that were shallower. In fact, the corals basically blocked the view of the shipwreck in a, a number of cases. But so this was much shallower, maybe in the 500 meter range. Down here would probably be a lot slower of a process. <laughs> yeah. Definitely on the order of decades. Here's a living thing. Go for like a half zoom, Just an ID sort of zoom. Oh, C pen. Oh, let's see. I need a bit closer of a zoom. Yep, go for it. Yep. 
No, I can't be sure, actually. Uh, it could be a C pen, but it actually looks like it's attached to one of these rocks. Oh, okay. And that would make it not a C pen? Um, the, the, the base doesn't look very C pen ish. It looks okay. like a solid base. If we can get a closer look at it, we can see if there's any yeah. other information we can glean from it. Let's do that. Okay, go for zoom. You can go further. You know, it could be a sea pen. It might just be kind of the base the peduncle might be hidden behind one of these uh, nodules. I don't really see any obvious nodes that would indicate it's a bamboo coral of any type. I'm not familiar with this kind of sea pen, though. So uh, it's good to get some good imagery of it. Given the, oh, yeah, there, there we go. Yeah, definitely a sea pen. Cool. Did you get what you needed here? Yeah. Okay. Let's go wide. Thank you, Steve and Steve. <laughs> the Easterly Steves. <laughs> the Eastern Steves. <laughs> Are sea pens a coral? Yeah, they are octocorals, uh, like a lot of the uh, corals we've seen attached to the hard substrates here. Uh, the sea cucumber, yep. Uh, but unlike a lot of the corals that we've seen so far, they typically don't produce a, um, a solid skeleton um, you know, that you can cut or a snip or, you know, attach this to the rock. It's typically more of just like a stiff, um, stiff rod that kind of keeps it erect a little bit so that it can feed in the currents, put out the polyps, feed in the currents. Mm. And they're anchored into the sediment by a peduncle that kind of inflates like a balloon a little bit uh, to keep them anchored into the sediment. They can actually be buried quite deep uh, also. There's not a lot of activity uh, questions coming in. It's Saturday, right? It's Saturday. We've got some people tracking. Not as many as the weekdays. Oh, we had the question about how we know where we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. There's a couple different ways. On our ROVs that are down on the seafloor, there's they each have a beacon on them, and those beacons when triggered will emit acoustic energy or sort of a ping or a sound and then on the whole of our ship kind of lowered um, beneath the holder ship so it hangs a couple meters kind of in the water it has a receiver so this is a transceiver it's kind of this beast of a unit um, and that transceiver will receive the sound and from that information it will calculate a range and bearing from where the uh, vessels or the ROVs are on the seafloor and then that information can kind of travel through our cabling and then eventually we get a latitude and longitude combined with our satellite information um, and our IMU which tracks our pitch and our roll in a really uh, fine scale measurements and we can figure out where we are. Um, the way these beacons are triggered are either electrically so we can send 
um, kind of, hey, trigger, tell us where you are uh, through the fiber optic cables that are connected to the vehicles. Um, we can also acoustically trigger these instruments. So the transceiver, the uh, unit that's hanging underneath the ship, that can send sound as well. Uh, so that's the USBL or ultra short baseline. We also use DVL uh, to know where the instruments are and probably the ROV pilots could speak a little bit more about that, but it's a sort of dead reckoning and we have a pretty high kilohertz uh, ADCP on the bottom of Hercules, correct? Uh, uh, 600 kilohertz Doppler velocity log. I don't think it'll function as an ADCP, but okay. I could be wrong. Okay. It's Doppler. very similar though. Yeah. It's basically the same thing without the water column properties. There we go. Um, and so those two methods um, will work to figure out where we are. And that information is kind of that data is sent up to us and eventually comes in some various navigation screens that we use to move the ship and maneuver between targets. Thanks, Kate. That was a great answer. <laughs> Well, now we've got more people piping in. You can see one of those navigation screens on channel three right now. All right, if we don't see something pretty soon, we're going to have to do a round of how did you get to Nautilus? Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. That, the, that gets more convoluted every year. All the more reason to discuss it now, right? <laughs> well, I mean, kind of not not like this year. How did you get to Nautilus? But, like, <laughs> but also that an airplane, maybe. I got an airplane. <laughs> an airplane. If did anyone COVID come? Tests. Did anyone come from uh, California on this watch? No, we're oh. Vancouver Island in the Eastern Steeps. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is you know what I mean. I actually. Not on this watch, but there's people on the boat that came. People on the boat that came from yeah. San Pedro, yeah. That sailed over, yeah. Oh, I you do. Now I know ship. what you mean. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I wasn't. I wasn't <laughs> even trying to be difficult there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that woke me up a little bit. So now I think we're gonna do a round of. How did you get to Nautilus? Let's do it. You want to start? Sure. Um, so I I got here through the Ocean Science Intern Program. Oh, really? Oh, yes. No kidding. Wow. Oh, really? I did not <laughs> know that. Yeah. Now he's a watch lead. No, I'm still an intern. I'm just watching. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years later. <laughs> no, really hard to move yes. up. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was, it might have been like the first well, I don't know if it was the first class of interns officially, but it was the first class when Nautilus came into the Atlantic uh, of interns from cool. the Mediterranean. So uh, 2013, I think. Wow. Wow. So from uh, probably on the ship in Florida. Yeah. 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 There was, the first leg was in off of the Bahamas, I think. Right, right, right. Yeah. Stop crinoid here. Yeah. I've been skipping over these, but critters have been few and far between. Yeah, they, they've been coming and going. Go for zoom. The possibly bathy crinids, yellow ones. But yeah, I, I applied for the internship program and uh, came out as an intern during uh, a very eventful transit from uh, Galveston to the Cayman Islands. Mm. And then during the mid-Cayman rise leg, my first one. It's a very exciting okay, go ahead. opportunity yeah. for a biologist to get a chance to look at. Um, well, for me, I was still studying, just started studying corals at the time. Uh, and uh, getting a chance to look at some of the corals on in and around those uh, sea mounts and um, non-volcanic <laughs> hard substrates. You don't find corals very much uh, around um, 
black smokers and things like that. A bit shallower, but we did see some pretty incredible coral biology. What made that transit so eventful? Um, I recall it's it's a slow going coming through the Straits of Yucatan because you're fighting the Gulf Stream. And uh, and I think at the time we had some pretty nasty weather. Um, I don't know if it was a, a full-on tropical storm or a tropical depression, <laughs> but it was forming <laughs> through that passage, as I recall. So not not the greatest day to be at sea. Uh, but it's all pretty fuzzy. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to go? Should we go to Ashley next? Because you're our current ocean science intern. Ooh, good segue. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess it's it's a little different from how how Steve got here. Um, I was I applied to be an ocean science intern back right before the pandemic happened. Um, I would I was just about to graduate from my undergrad, and throughout my undergrad, I'd been watching like some of the Okeanos explorations, and I thought it was really really cool. So I did some Google searching, went down a rabbit hole. And uh, found the Nautilus, and I was like, "Wow, this for Zoom? seems really awesome. I can probably apply." <laughs> and so I applied and was accepted. Um, but then, of course, COVID happened um, and had to defer for a year. Oh, that's um, awesome. What are we looking at here? Nice Medusa. Yeah, it's a wow. It's like a type of Hydro Medusa. Fast. He's <laughs> flowing quickly. Very cool. That's really neat. Like a little golden bell. I think, I'm not sure if this one's a, uh, gonna get myself into trouble yeah. here. <laughs> um, could be a narco Thanks. medusa, but I'm not quite sure. Thanks video, that was great. Yeah, nice fly. That was perfect. Yeah, nice, those are tough shots to get. It's really cool. Bridge, Nav. Fifty meters, bearing zero seven zero, please. Um, yeah. So, oh. so actually, I want to hear the rest of you because oh. you were saying <laughs> you were supposed to come out and then COVID hit. Yeah, got and then delayed. COVID hit. Um, that got delayed. I um, was kind of back and forth. I was living in an apartment and then went to sea for about two months, uh, being a marine mammal observer. Okay. Um, during during COVID, and then uh, this year, I actually just started a master's program at University of Victoria when uh, Nautilus contacted me again, and Zoom. I said definitely I still want to come. So here I am. Yeah, for Cinchid Star. We're glad you're here. Thanks. Okay, okay, it go out. Out. <laughs> that one was that star is just a little bit bigger than the one we got last night. And Ashley, did you you went to sea on a different vessel earlier this year? Is that right? Yeah. So back at the end of, I guess it was the end of last year or middle of last year, um, I was on a different vessel that was doing uh, sediment cores for wind uh, wind turbine development. And on every ship that that does something like that, they have to have marine mammal observers to be in compliance with um, the um, Bessie and BOEM regulations so that's what i was doing yeah looking out for whales and dolphins and turtles but uh i was working the night shift so i didn't really see too much oh, <laughs> oh, sounds hard. tough yeah <laughs> it was a good experience but yeah not not a whole lot to see out there at night <laughs> did you see any uh during the day though um, I usually wasn't awake oh, during the day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did catch a glimpse of a couple of turtles near sunset, so that that was great. But yeah, at nighttime, not not really a whole lot out there. Do you have a, any type of like strong flashlight you could use or anything like that? Um, they did give us these like night vision goggles, but oh, they wow. only yeah. could see about you know five to ten meters in front of the ship. So oh, <laughs> if there wasn't anything like right there, we didn't see it. Was that infrared or um, thermal? Um, it was it was infrared, yeah. Cool. So it was it was pretty cool, but 
most of the time the ship was pretty stationary, so that there wasn't uh, too much of a, a risk of uh, hitting anything or seeing seeing uh, anything while we were moving or staying still. <laughs> I feel like we should do like popcorn and you decide the next person. <laughs> um, <laughs> elementary school style. Sure. Um, yeah. Popcorn, Gabby. What's popcorn have to do with it? You it's just like pick the next person. Yeah, it's like what you did. I never did grade this in school where it's like no. you'd finish like reading part of something out loud and then you'd be like popcorn, Gabby, and then you'd have to go next. Oh, okay. And then <laughs> when you're done, you're like popcorn, whoever you want to hear from next. Okay, so I'm a long timer long and storied history here. Um, in 2007, I started a, um, a PhD at the University of Rhode Island with a professor who is working with Dr. Ballard. Um, and he, before I even started, called me up on the phone. He's like, I'm like working at a, I don't know, an office job in Seattle. And he called me up on the phone and he's like, hey, before you start at school, do you want to come out for two weeks to the Black Sea and look for shipwrecks? And I was like, sold. I will do that. So I quit my job. And I spent a couple of weeks out in the Black Sea in 2007 before I started my PhD uh, looking for shipwrecks with Dr. Ballard, even before we had the Nautilus. And um, it was pretty fun. We saw some amazing stuff and I was kind of hooked. I finished out my PhD working on um, using ROVs to make maps and you got all my data from Herc. So I've been sailing with Herc this whole time. Um, and then decided I wanted to keep going to sea. And uh, I worked for the US Antarctic program for a while as a technician, came back here, started working as an ROV technician. And now it's 2021 and I am working as an ROV technician. And I'm still seeing really Amazing new stuff. That's awesome, Gabby. You've seen so much of the deep sea. I cool. yeah. <laughs> Percentage wise, not very much, but yeah. yes, I've seen some cool stuff. I've seen some shipwrecks, seen some cool biology, neat geology. There's a pancake urchin on the left. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice one. With its walking shoes. <laughs> Um, Might be going a little bit faster than walking. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's running. Uh, it's okay, running how about on. Kate? I actually don't know how Kate ended up here. I think she's the only one I don't know. Um, I emailed the chief scientist at the zoom? time and asked her if there was any opportunity to come out um, either as a navigator or mapping, I was a graduate student at the time um, in oceanography at the University of New Hampshire. And she cool. found some okay, cruises for me and I came out and have been coming out mostly since, took a little bit of a hiatus to work um, for a couple years for an engineering firm. But yeah, very happy to be back. Cool, cold email. Yes. <laughs> awesome, I have, I've definitely done my share of those. Kate, you want a popcorn? Who's next? Oh, right. That's the second <laughs> half of this game. <laughs> um, man, popcorn, Steve, the movie Steve, video Steve. Ooh, movie Steve. Movie Steve. <laughs> I like that. Movie star Steve. Movie star Steve. Movie star Steve. <laughs> movie star Steve. <laughs> movie star Steve. That's Don't a you good be in transition. front of the camera for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to no, work. That's Bobby Argus. I used to work on movies. Uh, some of my first jobs out of college were as a production assistant on feature films big Hollywood movies. Um, but then five years later, I, after working in all types of film and video production, I Go went back Zoom. to school uh, for a master's in wildlife filmmaking uh, over in Bristol, England, at the University of the West of England. And when I was a student there, I went to hey, go ahead. a That's film great. festival in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And there I met Aaron Rainey another video engineer on this cruise. And she was about to head to sea as a Nautilus intern. 
and she told me and my friend, my classmate and friend, Sarah Matzik, that we should also apply because we were students and we were studying something relevant and we both applied and the following year, Sarah and I sailed as video interns. That was 2018. In 2019, I came back as a video engineer and this is my fourth season on Nautilus now. Tunicate, crinoid, and bamboo? Yeah, it looks really kind of denuded bamboo coral. Yeah, there's nothing much on there. Yeah. Naked skeleton. Go for zoom video? Star on top. So I will popcorn to Kelly. All right. I first came out on the Nautilus okay, in go on. 2018. Um, I was finishing my master's at UC Santa Barbara. I was studying um, coastal and marine resource management, but I was really interested in science oh, communication. And UC Santa Barbara, um, next door to us is the office for the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and talking with them, they informed me about the Nautilus, um, which was doing a bunch of cruises around the Channel Islands right off the coast of Santa Barbara. Um, and so a woman there encouraged me to apply to the Science Communication Fellowship. And I was able to go out after finishing my master's in the Channel Islands and then came back in 2019 um, and did the Johnston Baker uh, cruise and then was lucky enough to come back again as a lead science communication fellow this year. Um, so it's been really fun. Happy to be back. I'm going to popcorn. I think our last one is Josh. Okay. Um, yeah. I first came to the Nautilus, uh, I think it was 2013. Um, the RV lead uh, at the time, we had worked together on uh, different RV systems and kind of got to know each other. Um, and at that same time, I was starting, uh, I started up my own company called uh, Ocean Dynamics, uh, which I still run on uh, Vancouver Island. We do small vessel ROV operations and uh, habitat surveying, mapping, kind of a kind of a miniature version of the Nautilus, maybe with all, all the outreach and satellites and stuff. But um, anyway, a plug for Ocean Dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anyway, so he they needed a they needed hurt pilots, uh, and I'd been had some uh, about ten years of experience uh, operating different science subs at the time so I came in just as a contract RV pilot uh, and they kind of sucked me in because I dropped in in Puerto Rico and spent two months sailing around the Caribbean and island hopping and having a ridiculously good time and that kind of hooked me in and came back ever since uh, and then in 2000 the end of 2015 season there's an opportunity to take over the RV operations uh, manager position so I I took that and uh, we've been, been here ever since so I get into obviously run the RV shop uh, take care of the RVs and staffing and